Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. This is a topic that Jen and I are super passionate about. Um, just so you guys know who we are, if you haven't seen us before, my name is Allie McGinty. This is Jen Tourville. We work closely together, um, and we are in the HR consulting team at Marsh McLennan Agency. So today we're going to talk about elevating your team, but I always like to get to know who's in the audience. So would you guys mind raising your hand if you're in HR? Okay. How many of you guys are managers? And you could be an HR manager. Okay. <laughs> Good. So right, this is uh, relevant to all of us, right? We all want to know what does that mean to elevate our team. Great. Well, we're going to start out and we're going to talk about different types of leadership because leadership is really important before we can elevate our team. We need to have solid leaders in place. And then also we want to develop those future leaders. Um, so we'll talk about the different types of leadership. We're going to talk about emotional intelligence, work-life integration. So you notice I did not say work-life balance. So we're going to talk about that concept today if you haven't heard about work-life integration. Um, evaluating your team, we need to know who's on our team uh, and what potential they have in our organization. We'll talk about how we actually grow them, right? How we actually make them elevated. And then we'll focus up with engagement because we need to keep those employees once we have them on board and they're really contributing to our organization. So Jen and I, the HR in us, loves to have people collaborate. So you're not going to be surprised <laughs> when we ask you guys to talk to people at your table. If you did not introduce um, yourself to those at your table, I want you to do that. But what we want you to do is think about who do you truly admire as a leader and what qualities do they have? It can be any person in your life. It doesn't have to be a boss that you currently have. It doesn't have to be a, po a past boss. It can be even a coach or someone in your life. But what really inspires you about that person? So we're gonna give you guys a couple minutes and then we're gonna have you help us fill in this top 10 list, okay? So everybody talk to your table, collaborate, and then we'll come back together, okay? Don't forget to do introductions. All right, we're going to pull you guys back. <clears throat> Lots of good conversations happening, which we love. What were some of the things that you guys thought about? Just yell them out. You don't have to raise your hand. What were some of the things that came up? Some of the words. Some of the words that came up. Leaders that we admire. Transparency. Honesty. Motivation. Transparency. Encouraging and inspiring. Encouraging and inspiring. Integrity. Integrity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have heart. Yeah, I heard someone also say empathy, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Lead by example. Lead by example is a great one. I heard someone say passion. Yep. That's an awesome one too, right? We need to have passion. If you don't have passion as my leader, what am I going to do? I'm not going to come to work and have passion. You don't have it, yep. right? Anything else? Strong. 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 So I love, and when we say strong, do we mean strong as in like regards to skill set or strong? in regards to charisma, what does that mean? Okay. Yeah, absolutely, that's great. So I like this activity because I never ever hear anybody say, gosh, Ellie, I think that a great leader is someone that micromanages, make sure that I'm always on task, make sure that my butt is in uh, my chair at eight o'clock and leaves at five, right? And it's because, right, there's all these different things and it goes back to leading and inspiring and motivating and having passion themselves, right? So knowing what their purpose is. So we're going to talk a lot about that today and what really is a good leader because where that, that's where it starts, right? For all of you guys as managers, that's where it starts. You guys have that opportunity to impact your team. And so it really starts with you and we can't elevate your team if we can't get you guys on board and have that passion. And by you guys being here today, I know that you guys do. So when we think about leaders, we, there's the best, the worst, and where do you want to fall into that? Just like Allie said. So we've all had bosses who are maybe in the worst category, the know-it-all, the hovercraft, the bestie, the ghost, the bully. And as we talked about those words that we just threw out, we didn't really mention any of those things, right? The best bosses are cheerleaders, they're teachers, communicators, enablers, the captain. So as we go through this today, like Allie said, please think about where you want to be. Where, where will your picture be inserted here? And the best thing that we can do as individuals is learn from our past managers or learn from other managers around us. What are they doing really well and how can I take that on, right? How can I become that? Or what are things that really happened in the past and I'm like, ooh, that made me feel like and not take that on. Yep. So again, it starts with good leadership. Strong leadership is a first step in elevating your team. And so what we're gonna encourage you today is we're gonna talk about different leadership styles and you'll find your own. But what we encourage you to do is figure out every day, ask yourself, how can I be a better leader? How can I be better and show up for my team? Because that's what it's all about. And because we don't want you guys to be the winner of the don't be that guy award. We don't want your picture to be on the worst bosses list here. 
or have your employees say, my boss has no idea what they're doing. They're like Left Shark. Right. So. Every, everybody knows that Jen and I love Left Shark, so we always try to find one, yeah. a way to put Left Shark in. So <laughs> everybody remembers from the Super Bowl two years ago? Yeah, Left Shark. Yeah. So nobody wants to be Left Shark. Left Shark. And people leave companies, um, they leave their managers, not companies. 67% of the time, an employee is leaving because of their boss and not the company. So more than half of the time, they leave the company because of the boss. And I think that's a very staggering statistic. And I've even seen statistics that are even higher than that. So it's really important that we're aware of that. And we don't take it personally, right? We actually, if we do have people leave, we try to figure out what is that? What really happened to have this person leave? And how do we continue to take that as a learning opportunity? <coughs> the hardest thing that we're gonna talk about today is the difference between business decisions and emotional decisions. Because at the end of the day, we're all people and we need to treat our employees like people, but we also have to make smart business decisions. So how do we really find that balance? We're gonna talk about transactional leadership and transformational leadership. Has anybody heard of those two different phrases? Okay, some of you, yeah. Great, well, so transactional leadership is really what it sounds like, it's transactions. I come to work, I do this, you do that, it's kind of transactional. And they really focus more on supervision, the organization, and group performance, <coughs> right? So they're looking at the numbers all the time. They're saying, you know what, we met, uh, we met the numbers, here's your reward. So it's more rewards and punishment or hey, you really messed up on that and it's, gosh, now we need to write you up or we need to do X, Y, Z. So it's more the tactical kind of leadership style. And it, it's under the assumption that people are motivated by rewards and punishment. And if you've been to any of our other seminars, you'll hear us talk a lot about intrinsic motivation. How do we really get employees to find their own motivation? Because just throwing money at it's not gonna fix it, right? Oh, you did that great project, here's the $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really important that we really focus on that intrinsic motivation as well. Yep, and transactional leadership <clears throat> isn't necessarily bad, it's just the more historical management style that we all think of. And I think as we go through this and we're talking about your leadership style, we want you to evolve, to evolve more towards the transformational mm -hmm. style of leadership. Because transactional, that works for a really long time, right? That's what management was thought of. You come in, you make sure people do their job. And that's still a lot of times what we have our frontline managers act as, right? They maybe don't have the autonomy or authority to do things, so they really act as this supervisor, just make sure that they're following the rules, where they're not really leading and inspiring. So even if you have um, frontline managers or managers underneath you, it's really important that you make sure that you help them get to the transformational stage, which we'll talk about next. So transformational, it's walking the walk, right? This is someone who is a model of integrity and fairness. They are the poster child for your organization. They're the person that comes in, everybody smiles, right? They're like, yes, that's someone we wanna follow. They set clear goals and they have high expectations and that's okay to have high expectations because they're gonna help you meet them. They're gonna be there along with you. And they get people to look beyond their self-interest, right? So they get employees to say, gosh, I'm not just here for myself just to get a paycheck and get out, but they're helping employees be motivated and say, yes, I am gonna live and breathe for this company. I have the passion to help it succeed. They're gonna have people think outside the box and think outside themselves and outside their roles. Have you ever worked for anybody who's a transformational leader? Just thinking to yourself. And when you think back on that person, how do they make you feel? Are they inspiring? Is it somebody who you wanna be like? And so we have pictures of Oprah up there, <clears throat> Steve Jobs and Martin Luther King Jr. Right, those are people we can all get behind, right? They have a passion. They know what their purpose is. They know what their why is. They know why they show up every day and they have that vision and that dream. But they're not the ones who are sitting there saying, you need to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? They're the ones who have that vision, that dream. And that's really what we need as good transformational leaders. So I added this slide. Don't be mad at me because I know it's not in your PowerPoint. <laughs> but I really like this picture. I thought, how can I better articulate this? So when we have transactional leadership, it's people who are responsive, where transformational leadership is proactive, right? How many of us want to be more proactive in our organizations, right? That's everybody's dream, right? We don't want to just keep putting out fires. We want to make sure we don't have any fires. So it's really important that we look at this transformational because leadership is proactive. And the difference between the two is transactional leadership, just like Jen said, was more managerial, right? So it's saying, go, ready? Here's your, here's your assignment, go where transformational leadership says, let's go, we're in it together, right? Your goals are my goals, we're on the same team. How do we help get there? Let me know how I support you in that. So that's really what the, the difference is between the two. And this is my favorite picture because I think it's really clear. 
So a boss is someone who's standing in front and they're leading. And they're saying, okay, you know what, this is what you need to do. I'm your boss, this is what the rules are, this is what you need to do. Uh, it's I, they place blame for breakdown, something goes wrong. They're like, gosh, you really should have done something different. They use the people, they take credit, yet my department's killing it, right? And then a leader is someone who's in, in the crowd. They're doing the work with them, right? So they're not saying, gosh, I'm too good to do that, or that's you know, uh, below my pay grade, right? They don't say that. They're in there with that saying, yeah, you need help, tell me where I'll be there, right? And they depend on goodwill. They create enthusiasm and they say we, right? So if something happens, they say, gosh, you know what, next time we, have to think of a better plan, or maybe we have to evaluate what happened. It's not you, you, you. Um, and they say, let's go, right? So we said that. So I love that picture because it really articulates the difference between a boss and a leader versus transactional and transformational. So Nelson Mandela said, a leader is like a shepherd. He stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go ahead, whereupon others follow, not realizing that along along they are being followed from behind. So right, so that is us saying a leader isn't someone who's standing in front of us saying, come on, let's go, let's do it. But instead it's the silent cheerleader in the back and they're the one who is giving credit or credit is due. <clears throat> so now let's talk about servant leadership. So servant leadership is one of those concepts where we talked about really a good leader, right? So this is kind of very similar to the transformational leadership. And servant leaders are those that are really serving their people. So they come to work every day and they say, how can I serve you? How can I show up and help you, right? Old school thinking is we come to work, we work for our manager, we do everything that they ask us to do. Now it's kind of this thought process that we're a team, right? We're on the same team, you help me, I help you. And so the important thing to remember, and I don't wanna to talk too much about generations because I think that's all we talk about nowadays, but that's an expectation. They don't want someone who's gonna come in uh, the millennials, they don't want someone who's going to come in and say, here's your task, here, go. Um, Jen and I had an intern at one point, and she was, we were in the car on, on the way to a client. She goes, you know, Allie, I was applying for a, a job, and they said to me that I had to be there exactly at 8, and if I was a couple minutes late, it was going to be a performance issue because I was going to let the team down. And she goes, do they not know I'm a millennial? <laughs> and, I, and I chuckled because I was like, yeah, I mean, she knows, right? She's in HR, so she gets it. But she's like, that's not going to work for me. What if I oversleep one day? What if I hit traffic, right? So she's thinking about that. So we have to have some flexibility in serving their people. And so I think a lot about that is, too, when we have expectations as a manager, what is our expectations? What's it based on? Is it based on a policy or is it based on our own preconceived notions of what management used to be? Is it what we think we should do? So are we really challenging ourselves to think outside the box and serve our employees? And we'll talk about work-life integration later, and that's a big piece of it. And then it's a revolutionary movement. It's actually been around for about 40 years, yep. um, and it's continuing to gr uh, gain momentum. Leaders are looking to change to servant leadership because people can get behind leaders who serve their employees. And I think you said passion, right? Someone back there when I was walking around said passion. It's someone who gets everybody on board and saying, let's do this. We got it together. So see, seven secrets of servant leadership. The first one is value each person. If you have 30 direct reports, it's going to be hard to know exactly who each and every one of your employees is. And that's a challenge. <coughs> but it's important that you know what makes each person tick. Are they married? Do they have kids? What are their hobbies? What are their sports? And do you have conversations about it? Do you have meaningful connections with them? Because each employee deserves trust and respect. And they, for the most part, want you to care about them as individuals and at least take notice to things that they say. And inspire others by communicating your purpose. We can't talk about purpose and passion enough. You'll hear Jen and I throughout our whole lives that you listen to us talk about passion and why. What is your why? What's your purpose? Why do you show up every day? Because people get behind that. People get behind your passion. They don't get behind exactly what you do, but they get behind your mission and your vision. So as leaders, you need to know what that is. Why do I show up every day? Why do I love this company? Why do I love this job? Why do we have opportunities here? And you need to sell that. You need to tell other people what your passion is. Mm -hmm. Because people get behind a purpose that's bigger than themselves. And then set aside self-serving behaviors. This is the hardest thing from going from an individual contributor to a manager because you need to give away some of the credit. And that's okay. It's hard, 
right? Because we want to get some of that credit for all the hard work. And sometimes we spend all the hours developing employees and coaching them and helping them figure out projects. And then everybody's like, wow, you did such a great job. And you're like, you didn't even know all the time that I spent doing all the behind the scenes work. But that's okay, right? It has to be selfless. And it's encouraging people to set aside those self, um, self behaviors and again, focus on serving others. Tailor leadership to each employee. This is probably one of my favorite things because how many of you guys know exactly what is your employee's learning style? Do you know if your employees would rather sit down and have you walk through it with them, if they'd rather have you show a picture or just they wanna try it by themselves, right? Everybody has a different learning style and it's important if we wanna get them on board and elevate them that we know what their learning style is. And so it's really funny, I laugh at myself because I do this and I was in a meeting once and I was talking to someone and I was telling them and they didn't understand what I was saying and I was like, let me draw a picture. And then I was like, gosh, that's the HR in me, right? <laughs> let me talk to a different learning style. So it's really important that we tailor our leadership style to every employee. And some employees, like I talked about, really like that personal one-on-one. -on -one. So maybe we sit down with them and we start the conversation about, <clears throat> how's it going? How's your family? What's going on um, in your life? And you build those personal relationships. Other people might be super tactical and be like, can you really just not waste my time by talking about that? I really just want to go to the task, <laughs> right? And it's important as a leader that we know that because everybody is different. And I say this is the biggest leadership downfall is that people don't shift their style to who they're talking to. As a manager, it's our job to shift our style to the employee. It's not the other way around. Be a selfless mentor. Um, it's important that we don't withhold knowledge. So as a manager, you probably know a ton of information about the company. There are some things that you can't disclose and that's okay. But if you've been with the company, share the ins and outs. Share the political battles, right? Share why things are the way they are. And it's okay. You have to be a selfless mentor. You can't say, well, gosh, it took me years to get all this information, so I'm not gonna share it. <coughs> it has to be disclosing that information. And demonstrate persistence. Sometimes when we come up with a new idea, we talk about it one time to employees, maybe we talk about it at you know, two employee meetings and we think it's gonna be living and breathing, we expect that. But it takes a lot of time for people to get on board um, in certain uh, situations. So it's really important that you live and breathe that all the time and continue to deliver that message. If it's something that's so important to you, bring it up, talk about it at the beginning of each meeting. How are we living and breathing this? Right, so talk about it and be persistent. And lastly, be accountable. It's okay to make mistakes, because we all do, right? Even though we don't want to, it happens. But it's important that you're accountable and you own up to that. Don't pass the buck <coughs> and say, gosh, you guys, this is what happened to me. Um, so I think about even sales organizations, if you lost an account, sitting down with the team being like, gosh, guys, we lost this. Here's what we can learn from it. You know, next time I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Here's what I'm learning for it. Because then what, you ha what happens is you teach your employees how to fail forward. You teach them, hey, you know what, I made a mistake. I don't need to just blow it off, pretend like it didn't happen, but here's what I can learn from it and do better next time. So there's a lot of steps in servant leadership and servant leadership isn't for everybody. It's one style. And we're gonna talk about another style called level five leadership. Um, it's, this theory is from um, Jim Collins' Good to Great book. And what he says is get the right people on the bus, move the, the wrong people off the bus and shuffle people to the right seats. So we really wanna figure out the direction to drive. Uh, we wanna make decisions from our facts and have, um, have faith in those decisions. Know those decisions are, that's what we're gonna get behind and here's where we're going. We wanna have a culture of entrepreneurship and ethic. We wanna basically have a stop doing list. What am I doing today that I don't need to do? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. And embody the window and mirror look. So give credit to others, like Allie was saying. As managers, sometimes it's really hard. We work really hard as managers, but we need to give employees that credit. And the mirror, sometimes we have to keep assigning more things to ourselves, even though that seems awfully hard. Our desks are full, our voicemails are full, there's emails to check, but we might have to give ourselves more to do. And then understand the three circles. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So level five leadership, in the book, it talks about this is a hierarchy to get to a level five leader, and that's really really the highest leader that, ki that exists within level, level five leadership. And it's not saying that level one, two, three, or four are bad, it's just that's the journey to becoming a level five leader. So within those three circles that I talked about, 
In the book, Good to Great, Jim Collins talks about what can the company be the best in the world at? Where are we going to make money? How are we going to make money? And what ignites the passions of our people? So where those three, sec where, where those three circles intersect, that's what we want to be laser focused on. Has anybody read that book, Good to Great? It's, it's really a good read. Um, and there's a concept in there called the, the hedgehog and the fox. Now the fox is busy, he's running around, he's kind of into everything, you know, going crazy. And the hedgehog is laser focused. He's focused on one thing. And that's, it, that's what level five leadership is about, focusing on the thing that you can be the best in the world at, the thing that's going to ignite the passions in your people and what's gonna make you money. Is anybody taking the string finder? Who's a maximizer, anybody a maximizer? Yeah, you're one of those people, right? You're like, I get this, I'm gonna <laughs> live and breathe that. Totally good for you. <laughs> so authentic leadership. So we're, you know, there's tons of different kinds of leaderships and I think, you know, there's key things to take away from each of these. We love this image because people know if you're not authentic. They know if you're faking it, right? Mm -hmm. Just like the duck. So you need to know who you are. You need to be self-aware. You guys, we giggled about this picture for probably about five minutes yesterday. Jen and I like to have fun, you know? Um, because it's true. People know. They know if you show up and you're not your best self or if you're lying or if you're just like, yep, we got to do this. This company is great. And you don't believe it yourself. So being self-aware and being self-aware of your perceptions. I always joke that we should always carry mirrors in front of us to say, what are my nonverbal saying? Because it's really important that we know, am I matching what I'm saying? And can people tell? Because that's going to be authentic. Um, you know, know what your strengths are, know what your limitations are, and, and be okay with that. Knowing if someone on your team is stronger in that area, saying, gosh, can you help me with this? Employees love when their managers say, hey, I need some help. Would you mind sitting down with me and talking through this? And then also managing your emotions. Knowing that if you have an emotional employee, even if you don't have the most empathy, being able to try to do that and show up for that employee. Mission driven, right? We have a mission for a reason as a company. It's not just to have something that's fun posted on our walls and our website, right? We really need to relieve that. How many of you guys can cite off your mission <coughs> statement? Go ahead. Can someone tell me what it is? Anybody willing to be a brave soldier? Yeah. To demonstrate that waste is preventable, not inevitable. To demonstrate that waste is preventable, not inevitable. And where do you work? Eureka, great. So that's a very good one. And so do you guys incorporate that into anything within your organization, like your interview questions, or you incorporate in everything you do? Evaluations. Evaluations, good. Interviews and everything, right? So that's what we need to do as an organization is really live and breathe that mission. Because again, it's not just there for fun because we think, oh gosh, every company has a mission statement. Let's just create one, see if it sticks, <laughs> right? We want to make sure that we really live and breathe that. And how can you continue to incorporate that in your team meetings? Right? So a lot of times even HR departments or different departments have their own goals or their own mission statements. Um, we're going to talk about team building later and we'll talk about how you can start off every meeting with some type of team building activity. But I also think you should do is talk about what's the mission, how are we living and breathing this? Where's our vision? How do we better help get there? Right? So it's really focusing people back <laughs> on that purpose and that why. And I think that's a big missed opportunity that we don't do as an organization. We have it there and we just hope people are living and breathing it. But really, what can we do to make sure that we're starting out every meeting? What are we doing? How are we doing on this? Are we really living true to this vision? Because if we're doing things that don't live true to that, let's stop doing it or we might need to change our vision. So then, um, again, focusing on results. Um, again, it's not about power. People don't say, gosh, I really love this manager because they have so much power. Um, leading with their heart. That's a big thing. Some people just aren't touchy-feely. And that's OK but we have to make sure that we appeal to the employees who are. And then focus on the long term, because hard work and patience pays off, but it's super hard when you have an employee and you're like, they're just not getting it. How do I help them get there? And so it takes a long time, but hard work and patience will pay off. And that's what authentic leadership is. It's showing up and being there every day for the employees and saying, we're gonna get there, let's figure out how we do it. Just keep going. Okay. So. We talked about the different kinds of leadership. Now we're going to talk a little bit about emotional intelligence and switching gears. Um, emotional intelligence is different than IQ. Um, in 2011, companies valued somebody who was emotionally intelligent. By 2020, it's going to be something that top employers are going to look for. It's going to be a skill that people are going to look for. Because if you think about it, people don't leave their jobs. They leave their 
managers, managers. right? So yep. that's why it's super important. Yep. So again, EQ is different than IQ. It's something that we all have within us, and it's something that's a little bit intangible. You can't quite put your finger on it. But it affects how we manage um, behavior, negotiate social situations, our relationships, personal decisions, um, and achieve positive results. So within emotional intelligence, there's four core skills that are under two basic competencies, our personal competence and our social competence. Our personal competence is our ability to stay aware of our emotions and manage our behavior. And our social competence is our social awareness and relationship management skills. So as we're emotionally intelligent, we also want to be mindful of our behavior. As managers and leaders within organizations, we want to have mindful behavior. Be open, stay on track, listen to employees, um, present ideas clearly, participate, be honest. These are just some things of mindful behavior that as managers and leaders within organizations, we really want to focus on. And being mindful is really important. Uh, mindful is the process of actively noticing and focusing only on the present. This is super hard. This is super hard. And I was just <laughs> going to say, you know, it's super hard not to have your phone out or your laptop uh, because we all have a lot to do. We all want to multitask, but we need to be focused and present and in the moment. I'm going to share a quick story. So I have a four-year-old nephew and uh, he was sitting down. And so I was sitting with my brother-in-law and my nephew the other day and he goes, I got in big trouble. And I was like, oh, what did you do? And he goes, well, Leo was sitting there and he was talking to me and he kept going on and on. You know, like little kids do, they talk and talk and talk and talk. And so he goes, Dad are, Dad, are you listening? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm listening, buddy, I'm listening. And then at the end of the conversation, he goes, Dad, so can we do it? And he goes, do what? And he goes, Dad, right? And that's so important because a lot of times it's easier just to be there and just say, gosh, okay, yep, I'm here with you, but I'm also thinking about the 10 things I have to do later today. And I'm also thinking about that big project that I have next week at work. It's super hard for us as individuals because we live in such a fast society to sit down and be present. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the biggest things you can do as a manager. When an employee walks into your office, turn off the computer screen, put your phone away. If it rings, don't even look. Don't even look at who's calling because you are saying to that employee, you're here, you're important to me, I'm gonna give you the time of day. I can always call that person back. Unless we're in the medical field, it's not life <laughs> or death, okay? So it's important for us to put the phone away, don't email, don't look at other things that are popping up, but really be present for that employee. It is super hard, but I encourage us all to practice it and to share the other manage with our other managers in our organization that. Yep. So really like Allie was saying with her nephew and her brother-in-law, you know, are you present? You're there, but you're looking at your phone. So is your mind there? His mind wasn't there, was it? He was on his phone and he agreed to take the nephew somewhere. Wherever it was. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're paying attention because then we're going to have better recall. We're going to remember what that employee was talking about. Um, being mindful hopefully helps us be more creative as well and more appreciative of our employees. Because we're really there and observing what they're doing. We're actually spending the time to get to know them and know the strengths that they're bringing to our organization. And also being mindful, this, for, this first bullet point um, is kind of a hard one for me. What if your thoughts were totally transparent? And the information I was reading on this was, would you think some of the things that you think? Some of the, you know, unfortunately, some of the things that go through our heads. Would we think those thoughts? You know, if something goes wrong, is this really a tragedy? Probably not. It's probably just an inconvenience for us. Something that makes our lives sure a little harder, but it's not a tragedy. And remembering that stress is a function of how you perceive that event. That's something that I need to remember because I can tend to get a little stressed out. So how am I going to respond to a stressful situation? Mm -hmm. If you feel over overwhelmed, remember that help exists. You don't have to do it all. It's OK to ask for help. That's a hard one for a lot of us, too, I bet. That's a hard one for me. If you don't know, it's OK. As an HR person and as a manager, um, there's no way you can know it all. But you can know where your resources are. You know where to go to look up things. It's OK not to know it all. It's OK to say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out for you. I'll get back to you on that. And that's an important thing that we need to practice, right? It's OK. It's not a sign of weakness that we don't know. But to our employees, we'll say, gosh, you know what? Let me think about that. I'm going to reconnect with you. And then make sure you reconnect, right? Make sure you don't yep. just say, I'm going to look into that and then not follow up and have a meeting. 
Um, but even if you don't find an answer for it, I'll say, hey, I'm still working on it. I just want you to know that I'm thinking about it. I just got to find my thinking or come to an answer or solution. Yep. I think it looks more thoughtful and like you're, you're really digging into that question and making sure that you're following up with a good response. And from an HR standpoint, there's a lot of things that we need to look up in, in the world of HR. HR is huge. So we, before we make a decision, we want to know all of our options. And embody soft openness. So um, we don't want to miss opportunities. We want to be attentive. Okay. I like this image too. Is your, real, is your office really an open door? You might think it is, but do your employees think it is? Is it half open, three quarters open? And so this one, a lot of times Jen think, and I think about this as, yeah, come talk to me anytime. We got an open door policy. But as an employee, I go up to my manager and I tell them things and they're like really defensive about it. Or they might be, um, nope, that's not the way it is. You're misinterpreting it, right? So it's, again, being mindful and being present and being open. So that's where we see a big dis disconnect between we have policies in our handbook that says we have an open-door policy. Managers are like, yeah, come talk to me anytime. But then when we have that conversation, it's making you feel like your thoughts are unjustified in or you're wrong, right? Because that's not what we want to do. Because whoever that employee is, when they come to us and they bring us the concern, we need to think to that person that concern is real. Right? It's real to them. And yep. so it doesn't matter what we see. And maybe we just need to help them get to a way that they don't see it that way. Um, but it's really important that we think about it. And I like this one as well. This image is pretty funny. So here's your open door and you're basically uh, you know, jumping off the ship. You're jumping out the, out the door. Um, so if you're asking for feedback, what are you doing with that feedback? Again, it's like an employee survey. If we're asking employees to give us that information, give us that feedback, we got to do something with it, right? Otherwise, they're not going to come to us anymore because where does the feedback go? They share it, they're vulnerable, they maybe feel uncomfortable sharing this feedback, and then as a manager, we sit on it and do nothing. So if we're, we really have that open door policy, we don't want the door to be half open, we don't want them to jump out the, out the door or off the ship, we need to really do something with that information that's coming to us. And I want you guys, to, I'll go back with your teams, and I want you to surprise them. I want you to sit down with each of every one of your employees and say, what can I do better to serve you? How can I better support you? And we'll talk about that coming up, but I love that. It's going to shock employees. They're going to be like, what? You care about how I feel? Right? Because it's different. Usually it's us having conversations with employees saying, hey, you killed it. You did a great job in this project, or hey, you need to improve on X, Y, Z. So it's a great opportunity for us to really open up that open door and then actually act on it. Yeah, like so, so going back to your offices and surprising them with that and creating that more vocal culture, um, we're asking for that feedback. Um, we're acknowledging those that speak up. We're being transparent about the feedback process. Being the first to reach out to an employee. Like Allie said, go back, surprise them today, be proactive. That's going to shock them, right? Embody um, the management by walking around because you're on their turf. Whether you know it or not, coming into your office, might be a little bit intimidating sometimes. So walk around, be on their turf, um, and be aware of when they do come into your office, kind of rewinding a bit, make sure your body language, you're not sitting at your desk like this, or you know, don't, don't be intimidating when they're coming into your office. And don't close the loop. Uh, don't leave employees thinking it's pointless to share information. Like I said, that feedback is so important. If they're being vulnerable enough to share it with you, do something with it. Because they could just not say anything and they could just leave, right? Because a lot of people leave their managers and they could just say, hmm, you know what, I'll just try somewhere else. Yep. So we, uh, we might not all be born as emotionally intelligent people. Um, maybe we have a really high IQ, but how can we increase our emotional intelligence? Well, if you have the desire to grow and learn, that's going to be one way. And just identifying that you want to, to grow um, and increase your emotional intelligence. And I think we've all heard the Michael Jordan, he's had a ton of, ton of success, also a ton of failures, was given the ball 26 times to take the game winning shot and missed it. And he always says that because I failed so many times, I've succeeded. And we have to be okay with that and encourage employees, hey, it's okay to fail, right? We're not gonna say, go fail, go fail. But we're gonna say, hey, you know what? It didn't turn out how we thought. We took a chance, we were bold, it didn't work out. Let's learn from it. And we have to encourage that because otherwise employees come to work and they say, gosh, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try to step out of my comfort zone because it could go terribly wrong. And so the good news is you can increase your emotional intelligence. Anybody ever taken an emotional intelligence quiz? Okay. Yeah. It's probably more fun than an uh, IQ <laughs> test, right? 
<laughs> None of us want to see that score. Um, so know that there are assessments out there and that maybe is something you can do or something you guys can do as a team with your managers. So now we're going to talk about a little bit about work-life integration. So, you know, I think the old school thinking was work-life balance, work-life balance, right? That was talked about all of the time. How do we find work-life balance? And even what will happen is sometimes we'll ask, uh, millennials will ask us, well, what's your work-life balance? But really what we need to do is focus on work-life integration. Because let's be real, work-life balance is dead, right? We all agree with that. How many of you are like, yeah, I come, I come home and I never think about my job? Doesn't happen, right? You're always thinking about it. Or there's always another project you could be doing or something else that you could be doing. So we really want to focus on work-life integration. Because work-life balance implies that the two don't intersect. Mm -hmm when they do because the thing they have in common is you. So that's why it's more of an integration than it is a balance. Mm -hmm. And Ben Franklin um, quoted in a biography that's saying that he liked to burn the midnight oil because it demonstrates per, um, persistence and character and in turn a person's value. And then later on he went to say, um, I kind of just did all that butt in the chair for visual. Like it didn't, I didn't have to burn the midnight oil. And I think as managers, that's something that we need to um, be aware of. That, you know, like our millennial intern, boy, if you need me there at eight, uh, eight on the dot and that's going to be a performance issue if I'm not and I have to stay till five, is that really productivity? Is she really being pro pro productive between eight and five? Could she be integrating her work life and working at another time? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Just because the perception is your butt is in the chair, does that mean you're working hard? And when she left, because she was going back home, we talked to her and she said, you know what I really loved? I love that you guys let me learn and you let me take on new opportunities, but you also let me do it within my schedule. She had a lot going on, right? She's working, she's going to school part time. She said, you guys weren't so regimented that I had to do this or had to do that. And you weren't like, hey, here's the project. You have to do it A through Z, but you told me what the end goal was and you let me do it, right? And so that's what it's about. Because for boomers, that was how were raised, right? That's what it was. You come to work, you show up five minutes early, you sit there, you do your job, make sure your manager can see that you're sitting at your seat, and then you leave at five o'clock, right? That's what the old school thinking was, and we have to move past that. So again, it's the new norm, and work-life integration, it's been around for a couple of years, but I really encourage you guys to focus on this because it's integrative. It's not a balancing act. It's not figuring out, okay, today I'm going to go to work and then I'm going to come home and I'm going to separate them. But, you know, with our changing demographics, we really have to be more creative. And too many people believe that in order to create great things, we need to make brutal sacrifices. How many of you guys want to sacrifice your family? No. How many of you want to sacrifice your career? None of you, right? I mean, so we have to figure out how to integrate them because it's, it's not a balancing act anymore. And we have all these smartphones, technologies, and remote capabilities now. Right? So people can work from home. It's not a matter of, well, we just don't want them to. It's they have that ability, so why aren't we letting them? So that they can be more productive when they can be. And so um, working smarter, not harder, used to be the thing, right? Work smarter, not harder. But it's, what about can we work in a more integrated way? So when I'm actually really worried about my family or my kids, I can be home with them, but then I can log in at night and I can work. Um, so I don't have to pick between the two. So millennials, again, we talked about that. Um, they're not to, meant to be chained to a desk, so don't try. It's going to backfire on you. Um, and then, you know, not ask, they're not asking to work less. They're just asking to work differently. And this isn't just with millennials um, or Gen Y. This is with anybody. It's not that we're saying, gosh, I want to work less hours by any means. They'll probably work more for you if you let them have that integration because they're more motivated and they can find that integration between the two. So this is another thing. We found a study that said 97% of people had some sort of flexibility within their organization, but 40% said they had no guidance on how to use that. So that's a problem with us as an organization because people don't know how to set those boundaries. And it's really important that we help them figure out what's expected because otherwise they're just going to do things and as a manager we're going to be like, mm, too far. right? So know what that is. Help identify what's that work-life integration and where does it cross the line. Because work-life integration really assures that people are coming to work and they're being their best. When they're here, they're focused, they're doing their job because they've already taken care of all the other things that they need. Um, and again, it says, even if everything blends together, um, you're doing your personal best. So we have this little timeline up here. 7.50 a.m., gets the kids off to school, come to work, focusing on my job. You know what, maybe at 2.30 I need to take the kids to a dentist appointment. Then I come back home at 4.30 and I'm on the call, making calls, trying to make dinner. 
5 o'clock, I'm making, having dinner with my family and being present with them. And then at 9 o'clock, I'm logging back in and getting some projects done and answering some emails. Right? Does anybody have that within their organization, allow for that? Yeah. How many of you guys would like that? Right? Because how many of you are like, mm, can't go to the doctor. I'll, I'll do my preventative care next year. Don't have time this year. <laughs> right? And then all of us are like, oh gosh, you're hurting our health care costs. But so that's a really, <laughs> right? So that's a really important thing for us to think about as an organization. How are we allowing people to be the best version of themselves? Are we allowing you to say, gosh, yeah, I go to the dentist. Make sure you get that taken care of. So you're, you're um, not worried about that and, and you're living your life and making sure you don't have to feel like there's a sacrifice because a lot of people will leave and say, gosh, I'm going to go somewhere where I don't have to sacrifice my family or I don't have to sacrifice being there for my kid's concert, right? That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. And the one thing with that, if you just back up a slide, Allie, yeah. um, we need to be mindful of FLSA. Yes. Um, I know we all saw the changes coming out. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. Yeah, so the question for those of you who couldn't hear was, how do we really find an integration balance for companies that you have to be there, right? So taking out, tra you have to be there, can't just not show up, right, for customers. Um, and then retail, you know, how do we show up? So if you're working at a store or you're working at a restaurant, we need people there to serve. That's a great question. And maybe that's also providing opportunities for the employees to help you sit down. How could we help you? What does that look like? Knowing that we have to serve our customers, what does that look like for you? Don't be afraid to ask employees. They'll have great ideas because they're already thinking about this. Well, if we could do this, this would be better. So feel free to ask them. But also it might be providing them resources like, hey, did you know that Miniclinic's cheaper and you can go there at any time so you can stop by before work? Um, and so helping them also find other resources that will fit that schedule. Um, but also just allowing, you know, I have a client that they have a very similar situation, but they get a lot of summer help. So what they're doing is they're sending an um, a memo to all of their long-term or all their employees um, that are full-time and saying, hey, don't forget that we have all the summer help. You guys work so hard during the year. We appreciate you guys so much. Don't forget that you have PTO. Feel free to take that. We have summer help. Make sure that we help fill those gaps so that you can take the time that you deserve and be there. Enjoy this weather, right? We're in Minnesota. We don't get a lot of time. So sometimes it's just reminding them of their, of their benefits as well. Is that helpful? Okay, yes. And so what I was saying is, you know, with all the FLSA changes yeah. that came through, we all saw that last week. Um, and we do need to be mindful of people that are paid hourly and that they're paid for their time checking email at home at night. So that's something that we'll have to take into consideration if you're looking at doing a work-life integration. Right. So make sure you're talking to your non-exempt employees what that looks like. Yep. So let's move on and talk about um, really elevating the team. 86% of top performing companies agree that people are their best asset. So we talked about being a leader, we talked about work-life integration, and now we want to retain our employees. So a couple of different tools that we have, you know, have you done any of these things? Have you done a nine box, a skills matrix, skills testing, do you do performance reviews? What do those things look like within your organization? So the first thing is a skills matrix. What that looks like, it's evaluating all the things that you need in your job to be successful. So we're looking at all the different things, right? Can you do uh, billing entry? So this is for an accounting position. Can you do bill paid? Can you do invoicing? Do you know how to do receiving payments, credit card transactions? And then what we do is take everybody in that accounts receivable position or whatever the position is, and then we put their name and fill in the little circles. So this one's circles, that one's squares, different colors. You guys can do it however you want, but make sure you have a key so you know. And then we evaluate our talent. And we say, gosh, you know what? There are some, Mitchell really needs to improve in a couple areas. I need to help him out with that. So we're going to have to sit down and we're going to talk about Mitchell because, hey, you know what? I want you to be high performing. And I want to help you get to where you want to be. Because no one's like, you know what? I don't want to do my whole job great. No one says that. <laughs> so it's really important that we help them get there. And so this is one tool to do that. It's a tool to evaluate our team. And sometimes we can sit down with the team and say, you know what, um, how many of you guys manage HR teams? Raise your hand if you manage an HR team. Okay, a few. 
All right, so there's something you can do to talk about HR competencies as well. Where do you fall within those? Um, so just a great example of filling it out. And again, this doesn't take a lot of time. It's you as a manager sitting down and saying this. And another thing that you can do, our microphone's going off, what you can do is you can sit down with those employees and say, gosh, you know, here's what I'm thinking. Don't show them where everybody else is, but show them where they are and say, what do you think? Is there an area maybe that I rated you that you can perform this out um, above others that you want to still improve on, right? So it's okay to share that information for the employee. Anybody ever do a nine box or a nine block used interchangeably? Yeah, so the funny thing is people think this is a really scary tool. Really all you're doing is looking at it, identifying what your blocks are, and then you populate your name. You can do this as an organization, you can do this as a department, whatever it looks like. But basically what you do is you take performance on one scale, potential on the other, and you look, where do I put these employees? So I recommend that you create definitions of what they look like as an organization. Um, and then what happens is we put people in the box. <clears throat> when we get yep. people in this underperforming, when Jen talked about level five leadership in the beginning, get people off the bus if they shouldn't be there, give people time to adjust to change, especially if you're a new manager and you're like, gosh, I know I've been on the same team as you for a few years. I know we got to work on some stuff with you. Set the expectations and say, you know what? We got a year to get on task, right? We're, I'm going to give you that time. I'm going to give you that time to work with you, but these are the changes that I need to see. So then we put employees in these boxes. And the biggest thing that um, we see happen is people do this nine box or the nine block, whatever you prefer. And then we're like, great, that was good. We did it as an organization. What a success for the year. <laughs> and then we forget that it takes a ton of work, right? Because now we have to elevate them. And so thinking about performers, it's putting them in there and saying, okay, is this a person considerable um, or can I really help them, you know, learn X, Y, Z skills? So we have to really help elevate them and give them the tools. And we'll talk about that next. String finders, um, most learning programs help us become who we are not, right? So it's great. <laughs> it's true. I like that you laugh because I laugh about it too. It's, oh gosh, you have a deficiency in this, so we're going to send you to this training program and you're going to leave and you're going to be great. And then we get mad that we invested in the training program and that the employee isn't better. And we're like, well, that training wasn't effective, but it's not necessarily what we should be doing because what we should be doing to see is there an opportunity for that employee to have it, right? So there are things that people just aren't inherently at. And so what I joke about the question where it says people think, 86% um, think that people are their greatest asset. When I look at financial statements, I'm like assets, oh, people, right? I don't think of all the other business assets, right? Because I think about it from that perspective. But, because I'm not a financial person, right? That's why we have an accounting and finance team, so I can have them do the hard work. Yeah. So <laughs> um, people think about, um, their strengths and we need to focus on that and so um, a lot of times when we have kids in school you know they get a bad grade and we're like gosh they're just not going to go do we need to get them a tutor should we get them a tutor how do we do this they need to be better at math they just need to be better at it and it's like we put so much pressure on it and yeah there might be some things that we can help them improve and grow but I like this quote this is one of my favorite things everybody is a genius but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid right because we can't be great at everything. We want to be, right? And we try, but there's things inherently that we're better at than others. So a good opportunity is to figure out who's on your team by looking at their strengths. What are, what are they, right? So if I have people who are the maximizers on my team, am I getting, giving them the opportunity to just kill it and be really good at their one area? Or people who are really good at empathy, am I letting them have the opportunities to build <clears throat> relationships with others? There's a whole bunch of different other ones, and we could talk about strength finders all day, but at least evaluating who's on my team and knowing. So we can either use that to our advantage as growing our team, or we can use that as our advantage to really helping um, understand who they are. Yep, and in understanding who they are, has anybody done uh, the DISC assessment? I've done it uh, years back, but really another behavioral assessment tool for the employee to understand themselves better, but also as managers to help you understand them better. What makes them tick? How are you going to manage them? What things are important to them? So it's just another great tool along with the Strength Finder so we know what employees are good at and what's important to them. And there's a million different tools out there. So if you guys want to sit down and talk about some other options out there because you've heard of these and you're like, eh, not for our organization, we'd be glad to. We just didn't want to bore you with talking about each and every one of them today. Yep. And, and like Allie said, you know, a lot of times we focus on, for example, if you're a parent and you have a, your child has a bad grade, we spend most of our time focused on that bad grade. We spend most of our time focused on 
if, the, if an employee isn't doing something right. So we really want to make sure that we are focusing our attentions on what can that person be good at. The fish can't climb the tree. It's never going to really be able to climb that tree. So what can we be good at? Um, it's not just what you're good at, but what your core strengths are, what you're good at just inherently. And the activities where your passion, your talent, and your ability, where all of those things collide. So what I want to do right now is I want to get everybody to take a break because we've been almost here for an hour and we're supposed to move every hour, right? So I want everybody to stand up, uh, take a probably about a 10 minute break. So we'll come back at about uh, 38 after. Sound good? So we're going to show you guys a quick little video. So when we say union is strength, we're not talking about labor unions, just so you all know. I didn't want anybody to get mad at us. Um, <laughs> we're talking about teamwork. And so it's really important that we focus on that um, as an organization, and we're going to talk about teamwork, but we thought that was just a great way to get back from the break. <clears throat> Now it's not going to show you guys what we see. Stay tuned for technical difficulties. All right, there you go. So are leaders born or made? What do you guys think of? What do you think? Are leaders born or made? Both. Yeah, a lot of times there are skills that people have that are just inherently make them better, right? You, people just show up and you're like, how are you so good at this? I had a friend in high school who everything he did, he just seemed to kill it. Like, he'd pick up a guitar and he'd be like, oh yeah, I can play that. He'd, he'd play baseball, he's like, yep, got a home run. And I was like, who are you, right? Like, how did you get like this? And some people are just naturally that way. But what estimates say, best estimates say that um, people are about one third born and two thirds made, right? So there are certain characters of our employees that we can look at and we can say, you know what, I can see it. I can see that you have that leadership uh, ability, um, but then we also have to make sure that we help make it. So it's through different trainings, learnings, observations, um, and giving them practical skills and giving them the perception to do the job. So up here we have, and some of these might match what we talked about earlier in the beginning activity, but across different, 60 different countries, they found that leader attributes were these different things, things like integrity, charisma, inspirational, vis visionary, encouraging, positive, confidence builder, dynamic, team building, and so on and so on. So are you looking at your team and saying, gosh, do you have these potential things? Because the best thing that we can do as a leader is figure out who's our successor, right? Who's going to take my place and being open to that? Because if you've worked so hard for a company and you've worked so hard to build that, Keep that going. Help someone else be successful. I remember uh, growing up, my dad always said, my biggest accomplishments in life are having people who used to report to me now be managers or now be leaders in our organization. He wanted to help develop them to that next skill. So are we thinking about it from that selfless manner? Um, and then, you know, these attributes are common things, and they talk about communication ability and emotional intelligence. And then also before a leader is born, developed um, skills, through life experiences. So are we giving our employees the opportunity to get those life experiences or those challenging opportunities? 
This is the biggest thing that you can do with employees is set clear expectations, right? So in anything that we do is set clear expectations. If we're gonna move to work-life integration plan, um, setting those clear expectations. If an employee wants to grow and develop, set clear expectations. It's now you're not gonna become a leader tomorrow. How do we get you there? What's your perception in the organization? What do you want it to be? And then let's help develop you. So there are some tools to do that. And as an organization, we need to have a plan for each and every employee. We need to look at each and every employee from the receptionist to the CEO, and we need to say, what is your plan? And figure it out. Because that's what's gonna create engagement. None of us wanna lose our receptionist. I don't know, you probably don't have as cool of a receptionist as we do, but the, the thing is, we wanna make sure that we have a plan for each and every one of our employees. So where am I today, right? So having, this, having an employee fill this out and figuring out where am I today? Where would I like to go? Areas of strength and developmental opportunities. And then the manager fills it out. So it's a conversation going back and forth, sitting down, having real talk, right? Well, gosh, you know what? If that's really what you want, then let's help change that perception. Or there are some things that you're doing that I think are in in interfering with getting <clears throat> you there. And then again, having that plan, it's really having a how I plan to get there. So what types uh, formal learning am I going to do? What types of on the job? Is there someone I can job shadow? I uh, get to know people. Who else in the organization can help you get there? Right? Who else is important and critical that you need to meet with, at least to understand their area or their department? And then, you know, develop your brand. This one's an important thing. You know, a lot of times when we have employees who are just not really, you're like, you're not aware of how you act, come off or behave to other people. Are we sitting down with them and saying, hey, what's your perception? What do you want your perception in the organization to be? And I bet you none of them are going to say, I want people to think that I'm really mean and unapproachable. <laughs> so what we say is, well, gosh, have, have a conversation with them and say, okay, if that's your perception, talk to other people. Say, is that how I'm coming across? Because that's not how I want to. Right? So getting that feedback <clears throat> and having honest conversations. And then, of course, you know, a mix of what clients or projects you need to work on. And then what else? What else is out there? And there might be things specific to your organization that they can do. And what happens to you guys when you write things down? You remember it. Yeah. Are you more likely to do it? I know I am. So I like those two previous slides. Um, even for myself, I've filled them out. Just because I think if you set goals with a purpose, whether it's professional or personal, you're more likely to attain those goals when you write things down and mm -hmm. remember them. And talk about them with other people. Jen and I talk about those all the time. We both shared ours with each other because we said, what do you want out of your career and what do I want out of my career? Because we own some of each other's engagement, right? We're coworkers. So, and maybe it's just because we're nerdy. I don't know. But well, we did can, it. <laughs> what can we do to help each other to right. get there? So if that's what you want, okay, well then we'll yep. give you that and we'll do this. So, I mean, encourage that. And maybe even talk about it with other managers, right? So maybe your peers and say, this is kind of what I'm wanting. Can you, can you just help me keep on track? If I tell you, it's kind of like um, the accountability thing. If you go to a gym and people know you go, you're like, ah, they know if I'm not going to go, right? It's kind of that, we all need that accountability. Um, SMART goals, also helping create, you know, SMART goals for your team, um, giving them specific periods, giving them mutual agreement. So it's not just, Sophia, oh, here's your goal. And then we're like, oh, don't agree with that one, right? So mutually agreed upon goals. And then it's really determining those long-term objectives and how we get there. Um, and then also figuring out, okay, how do we prioritize our goals? What's critical, what's important, and what are some optional things that just could be filled in and can do at any time? And then take the action. So here's just a spreadsheet you could fill in with those employees and we prioritize, okay, how important is it? What's the description, the purpose, who else is dependent upon it? Maybe I need, maybe it's dependent upon HR helping me, you know, get approval to pay for this class. Um, a target date notes and if it's completed, right? Because if we have this, we're more likely to do it. And so we don't have the conversation. I didn't mean to blind you with the thing. I'm sorry. Well, yeah. um, <laughs> and then if we have a conversation with our employees and they're like, gosh, I'm not growing or developing or it's not happening fast enough, we can pull this back out and say, we're still working on it, right? It takes both of us. It's not just me, but it's you also meeting your expectations. So some organizations have fast track programs. It's probably not as common. Does anybody have fast track programs? Okay. So basically what fast track programs are after we identify, you know, who are some of those leaders that we want, it's really elevating them. So giving them a lot of opportunities uh, to show leadership and then get them um, in place so that they understand the business, they have some leadership skills, and then, you know, we have succession planning for the organization or our future leaders identified. A lot of times this happens in high turnover positions or even in, you know, retail positions where there's just so many stores um, or just really big organizations. Dual career ladders. 
it's important that we realize that not everybody wants to be a manager and that's okay. Um, but also knowing that we, not everybody can be a manager, right? We can't have 10 different managers <coughs> not managing no one. So how do we also give other opportunities for growth? And some of that is providing other type of, thank you. <laughs> Don't want it to be a safety <laughs> issue. I learned. Um, technical and professional skills. So right, we have someone here, your junior, we can develop. And then from there, you can either go into a supervisor or you can go into a technical or professional role. Right, so it's identifying that and outlining it because a lot of people think, well, to grow and develop, I need to be a manager. But really, what are those lattice opportunities that I can have? Or is there even more career development within my, within my current role? So it's really just outlining what that, that leads to because what happens is it gives people an opportunity to have recognition or to feel some type of career growth and then even an opportunity to have increased earnings. And then we have job rotation, enlargement, and enrichment. Job, and I bet you a lot of your organizations do this, even if you don't think about it in this way. But job rotation, um, I think about when I was in high school, I worked at Target. Um, one day I would be on the sales floor, the next day I would be in HR in the office, and then the next day I would be in electronics, and then the next day I'd be in jewelry. And so I was in all these different roles, right? So it's job rotation. I didn't get bored. I worked there for five years in high school, right? Because I had all this different variety and opportunity. No days were the same. So job rotation is a good opportunity to do that. And then maybe in that job rotation, we give people a little bit more flexibility and then they can have that integration, right? So maybe one day you're serving, but the next day you're hosting um, and you can have a little bit more time off because we maybe don't need someone there from that time or whatever it is. Uh, job enlargement, it's doing different tasks within the same job, right? So it's just a receptionist who we've also given her the opportunity to order supplies or you know mail out different things, whatever it is. So it's expanding the job, giving new tasks. And then lastly, job enrichment, it's increasing the depth of the job. So it's things like planning, organizing, controlling, or evaluation. So it's giving someone even more of a heightened responsibility. So now maybe you're doing this job, but maybe now also you're leading the meetings for our team and you're in charge of the agenda and the minutes and you're in charge of being the facilitator. Yep. Any questions on that? And mentoring programs, um, when we were doing our top 10 list and I was walking around, I heard people saying mentor, somebody I used to work with. Um, does anybody in their organization have mentoring programs in place right now? Okay, a couple of you. Um, mentoring programs, they're a lot of work. It's not something that you can build and just put on the shelf and, and say, oh, it's going to run itself. Because we, we have to develop the program. We have to understand what our baseline is. What do we want to train? Do we want new hires to go through it? Do we want existing employees to go through it? Both. We have to decide what that looks like. And we, really, we want to ditch the do-it-yourself mentality. We want to spread the knowledge. We want other people to know what we know. Um, it gives others the confidence to grow in their, in their role. And it's not easy. Like I said, it's not something that you can build and put on a shelf. And unfortunately, pretty much nothing in HR is. Um, and Dang it. I know, right? And 80% of employees say they want to be mentored at work. It would be a great retention tool for you. And mentoring programs. So again, you're going to want to um, have somebody within your organization, if you want to develop one, who's going to champion it? Who's going to be the leader of it? In the last organization I worked with, it was the VP of HR. Um, he was uh, the sponsor of the program. Let me build it, though. So I built all of our activity books, our training books, our mentee books, our mentor books. Um, I had that solid plan in place for him to then go back and present to leadership and get it rolled out. Then we looked for who we want to be mentors within the organization, and we asked leaders within the organization. We sent out an email and said, would you like to be a mentor? Had people apply, but then we also engaged their manager before we selected those mentors. We trained on a regular basis. We had quarterly meetings where we talked about what's working, what's not working, what do we need to change? And we didn't always put, uh, put mentors with mentees in the same department or even on the same team. So you're kind of getting that cross-functional um, look at the business. And it's really nice because a new hire then has a friend outside of their department. Um, we create the framework for the relationship and schedule gatherings. We also had a gathering every quarter for new hires where we do just a celebration of our new hires. And then measure the success of it. After a year, has it worked? Have we retained people? Do people have job enrichment? Uh, it's just a good program to, to launch and see what it can do for your retention. And teach the business of the business. How often have you maybe started a new job and for the first six months 
Maybe you didn't exactly know how the company made money or exactly what it did. There's people that start jobs and don't exactly know everything. So we want to teach the business of the business. How does the company make money? How are we profitable? What are our KPIs? What, what, are, what things are important to us as an organization? Job shadow other departments so you can get a sense of what other departments do, how they impact the organization. Over communicate the why. Do you want to talk about our MMA university that we started? Yeah, we just um, launched MMA university last week and it's internal, our employer services team. Um, there's HR, um, loss, loss control and safety, work comp and health management. And we support our clients and we, um, Internally, we wanted to do a university so our peers, our colleagues internally could really know exactly what we do. And so we're doing just a short 30, 45 minute presentation over lunch sometimes to come in and learn a little bit more about what our function is within the department, within the department and how we provide service to the organization. So, and we had probably, we had our first one this week and had about 45, 40 mm -hmm. people show up. Yeah. So it's good. And someone came up and said, I've been here for a year and a half. I wondered what you guys did. Right? And it's, it's because you hear about it from when you're in your onboarding process, right? You hear about it in the first week. We know that we have a solid program for that and we know she heard about it, but who remembers that? You can barely remember what you're supposed to do or who whose names you're supposed to remember. Yep. So it's an opportunity just to do refreshers and remind people. And teaching the business of the business is really important. Um, opportunities to lead projects. Again, that job en enrichment, job enlargement. Um, possibility of stretch and lateral assignments. Like Ali said, not everybody within the organization is going to be a manager. There's not a spot for everybody. But what can we do um, to, give, to give people additional knowledge within the organization? We want to be transparent as much as we can be. Ali mentioned earlier, we're not going to, we can't always tell everything to the employees what's going on. But what we can, let's be transparent because if we don't, they're making stuff up, right? And then the rumor mill gets started. And my team, every month we have a meeting and we have, what's the rumor of the week or the rumor of the month? What's going on on the street? That way we can correct anything that's exactly. not true. <laughs> and then what's the state of the organization? What's the state of the company? Are you doing those kind of meetings once a year or more? Okay, we're gonna do a little activity. So, um, I know you all have notebooks um, in the center of your table. I'd like you all to grab one piece of paper. Please, please. So your notebooks should look like this. Everybody just take one piece of paper. All right, now that everybody has that piece of paper in front of you, I want you to go ahead and close your eyes and keep them closed. You don't need pens. Everybody always gets like, I don't have a pen, I don't have a pen. You don't need a pen. Don't need nope. a pen. Okay, keep them closed. I want you to fold your paper in half. Okay, now fold it in half again. Now fold it in half again. Now rip off the top right corner. hard. <laughs> Super strength. <laughs> now turn your paper over and rip off the upper corner. Okay, now you guys can open your eyes. Okay, everybody open up your piece of paper. You'll see that you created some type of snowflake, just like you did in kindergarten. <laughs> okay, everybody hold yours up. Yeah, hold them up. So everybody has somewhat of a variation, but there's a lot of different ones. Some people have two holes in the middle. Some people have no holes. Some people have one. Some have three. Some have corners around the side. Right? So you guys got the same exact instructions, but we came up with different products, right? Would it have been easier if we would have just told you an end goal and you could have got there? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and this, we like this activity because everybody comes up with things differently. And you know, as managers, when we're giving directions, we need to be very clear. 
If we're going to not just say, here's your goal, get there, or if we have expectations on how you get there, we need to be clear. And it's hard when you have your eyes closed because you're like, I can't look at anybody else. I don't know what they're doing. Which way do they fold it, right? So there's some, some key to that as well. But we need to be very clear, and we need to teach to the different learning styles of our employees. And we need to make sure that we're teaching people appropriately and not just with our own assumptions. So we say fold it in half. Someone was like, which way? Hot dog style or hamburger, right? Yeah, I heard somebody over yeah. here say, which way? Right. Long ways or, yeah, how, which way do you want me to fold it? I did this training with a client. They got so mad they threw the paper like, Allie, I can't believe you made me do this. <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yep. But, you know, it just goes to show a point. Yep, so when we are developing our employees, we want to make sure that our directions are clear, right? My directions were pretty vague, and I made you close your eyes, which made it even harder. But we want to make sure that we really set clear expectations. How, how are you going to achieve those goals? We're going to talk about the great work they did. All of your work was really great, by the way. Good job. Your um, snowflakes are beautiful and individual. Are. <laughs> and as, you know, as employees are folding that piece of paper and as you're developing them, you want to make sure you're coaching them along the way. And so they know where we're going. So we really want to focus on the employee. Your employees make your mission happen. You want to? Yes. Yeah, OK. So how to focus on your employees. Connect with your employees. Be present. Be considerate of their needs. Provide training tools and resources. Keep them in the loop. Again, if we don't tell them what's going on and we're not as transparent as we can be, they're going to make stuff up. Help employees find that balance. Help them integrate their work life if needed. Demonstrate respect for their time and their talents as individuals. And help them grow and develop. And that can be personally or professionally. Yep. Be an example to your employees. So really walk the walk. Have a good attitude. Have one-on-ones. Have department meetings. Be clear and consistent. And backing up with department meetings um, or one-on-ones, even if you don't have anything to talk about, you don't have any agenda items, nothing's happening, don't cancel that time. Because your face time is really important to employees. Welcome complaints. Again, if you're going to ask for that feedback, make sure that you're going to be open and willing to listen to it and maybe do something with it. Express appreciation. Apply policies consistently. We want to fairly distribute the good and the bad work. And ask questions. We want to ask questions of our employees. Again, if we're asked, we want that feedback and then we want to do something with it. And we can't ignore that our employees' well-being is important. It is our job. We want to know what makes them tick. Because people who agree their manager cares about them as a person are more likely to be top performers. And they're going to produce higher quality of work. They're less likely to be sick. They're less likely to leave. And they're less likely to get injured on the job. And I think you said you're a safety person over there. So that one's probably really important, right? Yep. So ask our, we want to ask our employees, how can I support you? What's going on? What's going well? What isn't working so great? What questions do you have about our, our organization? How do we make money? Do you feel like your work-life integration is supported? Do you have the tools and resources you need to do your job effectively? And then we want to do performance reviews. We want to spotlight their good work. We want to correct poor performance. We don't want to take the easy way out and have maybe a rating scale that has five, because where are we going to rate everybody? A four. You're nice. You are. Wow. Look You're at generous. That. It leaves yeah. room. <laughs> That's right. It leaves room for improvement. But if we have a four-point rating scale, doesn't that make our managers really evaluate the person instead of just giving everybody the C in the middle? In the middle, the mm -hmm. five. It really makes us um, really evaluate our employees, and we want to do that. So if we ever have to correct a performance issue, we have that. We get a lot of people who just also don't want to have that conversation. So yep, you're a five. Yep. And performance Hard. is an ongoing process. We want to be talking about this all the time. Coaching happens year round. And I know we say it, but reviews aren't a time for surprises. We want employees to know basically what they're walking into when they walk into that performance review, right? None of us should be scared going into a performance review, right? Because we should know what's going to come out of it. 
And timely feedback is important. And not to pick on our millennials, because they get picked on a lot, but they want timely feedback. And they want the good and the, feed, the bad feedback. Where can I improve? What am I doing well? They need to hear that. And don't rate everyone in the middle, because it's easy, like I already said. So as leaders or as HR, we need to make sure that we're coaching a majority in the middle, right? So we're going to have people who are our solid middle players. They may be considered our B players. They're doing a great job. We might need to coach them, right? We might say, do you really want to grow and develop? And some of them might say, I'm happy here. Let me be here. Let me swim in my lane. And we just still help them grow and develop. <laughs> Where we also need to make sure that they understand performance expectations. So a lot of times what happens is we have these really good players and they're doing great, but our organization has changed. Maybe we have new customers, maybe we've grown, and now we have different expectations and we still kind of have some legacy employees. So how do we help them get to that next level? Because there's a point where it's like, you know what, you were great in this role, but our company has changed. So we either have to get you there or we have to get you off the bus, right? So we want to coach those employees. We want, don't want to just say, oh, good, they're happy. They're fine. They've all, this is the job that they want. We want to still have conversations with them. Um, and then you can also partner them with your superstars. What superstars in your organization can you have them work on projects together so they're getting a taste of extra things? Um, and then also, you know, it's important that we don't forget our superstars. A lot of times we spend time with our low performers saying, you got to do this, or we're spending a lot of our time coaching and developing them. What about your superstars? There's actually um, tons of research out there about um, a curve of engagement. And what happens is we have super engaged employees. And if they are, and we're just like, they're engaged, they're happy. Gosh, I don't have to do anything, right? They're good. We're still having conversations. But if we don't do things to continuously meet their levels of engagement, they're going to be mad or they're going to leave, right? Because they're like, I'm giving you my all. I'm giving you all of this. And then if we don't give it back to them, they're going to leave and they're going to feel like we didn't uphold their part of the, uh, of the bargain. And we'll talk about that when we get to psychological contracts. So, you know, all sports players have coaches to help improve, develop, and continue its success. It is important that we always continue to have mentors. How many of you guys, as managers or HR, have mentors? Yeah, it's an opportunity for us. And they don't have to be formal mentors. I have probably about five that whenever I'm having a problem, I call them and say, hey, walk me through this. Am I being crazy? You know, help me approach this situation. So I have some formal through programs, but then I also have just people in my life who I've thought have been really good coaches. Mm -hmm. um, coaching your superstars, um, get involved in decision making, um, let them have some of that additional responsibility. Don't micromanage them. Um, and then also don't punish them for good performance. So because they are awesome at diffusing situations and they can handle anything we put their way, we don't want to just give them all the bad work, right? Because we don't want to punish them for being so great. You know, I actually, I was at a client yesterday and we were talking about um, a survey we did and one of the managers was like, I'm going to get all of our residents to do this. And so he had the best results. And then they started saying something. He goes, don't punish me for being the best, like at getting all these results, right? He was like, don't pick on my scores because I was the one who made sure we actually had enough data, right? So we want to make sure that we're being appropriate and not punishing people for doing um, good things, but also distributing that work. And that might be an opportunity for that B player to really elevate that or learn from that situation. And a lot of times when we spend time managing our underperformers, we might ignore our top performers, our superstars. We want to make sure that we distribute some of that attention their way because they need it, because they're, they're performing well, and we want them to maintain that and not leave our organization. Yep, absolutely. So Blake and Mountain's uh, leadership grid, what that talks about is it talks about concern for task and concern for people. And what happens is some managers have a super big concern for the task. We got to get this done. We got to meet this. We got to have these timelines. And that just might be a part of the business, right? We might have a really um, important business that just lives and breathes on deadlines. But then also some have too much of a concern for employees or they don't have a right balance. So we have the uh, country club manager, which is someone who has a really high concern for people, but a really low concern for task, right? So that's, you know what, I just really want to focus on having a safe, comfortable working environment. I don't want to have any conflicts. Let's all be friends. Let's hang out outside of work. Um, we have an improvised manager, which is really just someone who has a low concern for task and people. They just kind of show up and they're sitting in their office and we don't really know maybe what they do during the day. We have the task management person, and the task management um, is really just the person who is focusing on, you know, Theory X. People are here to work. So Theory X, we, we talked about transactional leaders in the beginning. It's very similar. 
People who to focus on team, the team manager, that's really where all of us kind of want to strive to be because we have to have a high concern for the task and a high concern for people. It's really important that we have both um, and know when to play to which one. There are certain times when we have to be more concerned for the task than we do the people and vice versa. And so it's important that we know that. Um, leaders will naturally have their own style, but effective leaders should adapt themselves to the situations that they're in. So there are certain situational leadership styles that really what happens is we have to, based on the situation, focus on the task, right? If someone is losing a ton of accounts and they're a salesperson and maybe they have some personal things going on, we need to care about them as a person, but we also need to be like, you know what, you got to do this. You, we're telling you right now, right? Like if you do not meet these expectations, we may no longer have a position. So it's really important. And so I like this one because it talks about, you know, there's delegating, there are things where we just, you know, don't really have concern for the person because it's like, hey, you know what, we're all busy, we just gotta do this. And then there are situations where, you know what, we really focus on participating. And we talked about the servant leadership before. Um, and then sometimes we just have to sell. We have to sell to our employees. This is a great idea. There's important and we have to kind of talk through to their own personal mission and buy that engagement and buy that, um, that passion from the employee being on board. So really our basic rules of feedback in this section, we want to make it timely. We want to give feedback timely to our employees. Get specific with that feedback. Be appreciative and get personal. Um, we had a, a team meeting probably about a month and a half ago and our manager said, how do you like to be recognized? Do you like an email, a phone call, a handwritten note, a case of beer? What do you like? So he was very honest in asking how we wanted to get feedback. Have you guys read How Full Is Your Bucket? <clears throat> it's a book. Um, it's a good one. It's a quick read, How Full Is Your Bucket. Um, and it's a good one um, that just talks about really how we recognize or how we feel people's positive emotions. And that's where that comes from. Yep, so it's a lot of work to know what makes each one of your employees tick. But if you're going to get personal and when you are giving that feedback, you, you might want to to know those things about employees and make it proportional. Again, you know, the, we're not going to recognize somebody with a trip somewhere for accomplishing a small task. So we want to make sure it's proportional to what the outcome was. Okay, challenges in teams and building careers. That never happens. We never have challenges. We don't have challenges, right? So some of our challenges might be lack of commitment, lack of creativity or diversity. We might have ineffective communication. We might have lack of participation, people that don't want to participate. And groupthink, where everybody shares a brain, wants to think the same thing, right? So we want to be fair and equitable as managers. We want um, the compensation to be fair, work, the division of labor, um, including good and bad projects like we talked about. And Allie loves this ball. I do. I love team and building she has activities. A, she has a, a mm -hmm. dice set that's like this too. Yeah, so it's a great opportunity. I love, I mean, we go into meetings and we already have these like, oh, it's another meeting. Let's make them fun, right? What else can we do? So I love doing some type of team building activity and there's millions out there, right? So we'll just start off the meeting where it's a quick thing. Everybody talk about your favorite movie, right? Or what'd you do this weekend? And so this ball, you just throw it around and then wherever your thumb lands, you answer that question. Um, I have dice that I carry in my bag everywhere I go, um, and with the dice you roll them and then you say, you know, whatever the question is. So it's just a good opportunity for people just to really build relationships outside of work and just you set the tone for the meeting, mm -hmm. right? You're just, okay, let's get down to business, right? You're setting the tone. Um, there's tons of activities, you know, we've done puzzles, you know, things like that, just quick puzzles, who can do it fast, you know, whatever that is, partner up. Yep. So it really breaks the ice in that, in that meeting. Um, some other challenges would be communication styles. Some people have really open uh, communication styles. You can probably tell our communication style. Um, individual biases, we all have them. Values, what are, what are our systems of values? Are there any power struggles on the team? That could be interesting. Managers don't know how to balance their employees' perceptions. And what about ideas getting rejected? or negative um, ideas around, um, negative thoughts around new ideas. Those are all challenges that teams might face. So what happens is we also face this resistance to change. Anybody read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? Or heard of it at least, Who Moved My Cheese? So we talk about changing goals. Organizations change all the time, right? That's the one thing that we can count on is change. Things are not gonna be the same as they were. 
How many of you guys have been with your organization for more than 10 years, or at least 10 years? Okay, how many of you guys have seen change in that organization? Yeah, even from maybe like the three months you've been there, you've seen change, right? <laughs> um, whatever it is, there's always change. That's the one thing we can count on. And that's why it's really important that we realize that when we change, we are moving what's expected of employees and we are moving their comfort and their safety. So who moved their cheese? I just included some of these things. You know, it's change happens. We have to anticipate change, monitor it, adapt to it, change ourselves, and then enjoy it. Um, and then be ready to change again because it's something that we can count on. Um, and a big thing what happens is people get stuck in this fear. You're changing something. It could be the best change in the world, but we're changing, right? People don't love change. We are creatures of habit. No matter how much we say we're adaptable and we're flexible, people are creatures of habit, right? Because you just totally, how many of you guys eat the same thing frequently? Yeah, I do. Like if you guys have other recipes for me, I'd be totally willing to take them because I feel like I eat the same things all the time. I'm a creature of habit, right? That's what, how we are built. So people don't like change because they feel like they lost control, right? They feel like I no longer have control over my destiny or my job. Um, and it's excess uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. And how we communicate this and change, roll this out to employees is super important. Anytime we change things, we need to make sure that our message is clear, it's concise, employees know how it's going to impact them, how it's going to impact their customers, what's the good and what's the bad. And we need to be honest about it. Lying and saying, nothing's going to change, we're doing this, we just bought a company, but nothing's going to change your jobs. It is, right? Because people are going to ask questions, and so we just need to be honest about it. Um, no time to prepare, right? So sometimes we just surprise people and we're like, it's happening tomorrow, and they're like, oh, right? We don't want to do that. We want to give them time to prepare. We don't want to give them years in advance, right? But we want to make sure that we give them enough time. Kind of like when we change policies within the company, right? Jen and I always say, give them at least 60 days, right? So they can make plans. Uh, concerns about their own competence, right? It's a lack of, it's insecurity, right? I'm not, am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to handle this change? I was really good before this change. How is that going to impact me? It's a fear of feeling like you might fail. Um, and then loss of flow. So when we talk about flow, um, one of the keys to engagement is being able to get in your world and master it and being able to really just figure out what your role is and just do it, right? Have you ever been working on a project and you're just like, oh my gosh, the day flew by. I was working on that. I just really got into my groove. And so that's a big fear. People are going to have to relearn things. They're going to, you're going to change things on them. Um, and then sometimes the threat is real, right? So um, our organization, we moved to a new um, system, a new big software system, uh, probably a couple of years ago now. And that's a big change, right? Because everybody was like, I've done this. I got my flow down. I know how to do it. And then we changed, and now they have to learn a new process, a new system, and it kind of took, it took longer, right? And you feel like you're not competent, or you feel like, gosh, I'm just slower than I used to be. I'm not good at this anymore. But then the other thing is, what if people are like, gosh, I just, I'm really not technology savvy. Like, I'm just not there. So when we go from paper expenses to computer expenses, how does that impact our employees, right? Because the threat might be there. There might be like, you know, I just really can't learn a computer. It's just, I'm going to have to leave. And like Ali had said earlier, with, um, with challenges um, to change, give employees some time to get used to it. Um, I had lunch with a friend yesterday, and, and she said, well, we had a, a, some new leadership come in. And I, I had lunch with the new leader, and she said, well, I've given everybody about a year to kind of get used to this, to get used to the new, to the new leader, to the new things that are going to happen to our organization. And now it's time to get on board with that. Um, there, there have been changes. There's been loss of control. It has been a challenge, but it's been a year now, and now let's get used to it. So what we have to think about is when we change something or we move people's cheese, we move there every day, people go through the stages of grief, right? So we don't think about it that way, right? We think about the stages of grief as losing someone we love or, you know, losing something. But really what's important is to think about it in this perspective because most organizations don't. Most organizations think about it, here's the change, we see the business reason, now we gotta do it, you have to be on board because here's the reason. We told you why, right? So get on board. But we have to think of that human element. And so, you know, most of us probably have heard of the five stages, but here's the seven of them with shock, right? Some of them being like, never thought that would happen. Oh my gosh, what? We are kind of the deer in the headlights. And then people deny, it. they're gonna go back on it. The deal's not gonna go through or, they're going to realize this method doesn't change and so or it's not doesn't work so they're going to go back anger they're mad right you moved their cheese they signed up for something different you told them the job was different now you're changing it so they're mad 
bargaining. Ah, well, if I stay, maybe this will happen, or maybe I should go somewhere else. You know, what else? What's my way out of it? Or, you know what, it's not going to affect me. If I talk to my manager, I'll say, gosh, this is why I should have an exception to the rule. You know, bargaining. And then depression. Coming to work and just being like, mm, this isn't what I fell in love with. This isn't where I want to be. And then testing. Seeking realistic solutions. Well, I know you said we should do it this way, but let's do it this way. Or what else can we do? And they're testing you as a manager. And then finally, acceptance. Finally finding a way to move forward and be on board with it. Some employees go through this super fast. Some of them may not even know they go through all these different stages. Some of them stay here, right? And then they become your culture kills. And you're like, gosh, we gotta get you on board, right? Jen said, you got a year to get on board. Let's, let's do it, right? You have to make the change. It's happening, it's real. And you might have to guide them through that. Going through this with one of my clients and you know, the manager said to me, Allie, gosh, I have this employee who used to be the best employee, super positive, always our just champion. We changed, we moved their cheese. He's mad. He's so mad. How do I get him out of that stage? It's having a conversation, right? Sitting down and talking about, I know this change affects you. It's hard, but we have reasons to do it, right? Here's our business reason to support it. How do I help you get there? How do I help you transition into this change? Or what are your fears? What are some of those unknowns still that I can help you? And every organization faces change. And so it's important that we look at it from this perspective because some people are like, yeah, change, woohoo, let's be on it. This was a bad process anyway. But the people who've been there for a long time might say, gosh, really? Mm, not really worth it. So challenges, helping team members communicate more effectively. We want them to be respectful of each other. Don't interrupt one another. Solicit new ideas from them. What are their viewpoints? What are their inputs? Using your team meeting time wisely. And I think using it wisely is starting off with the dice or the ball. It's a fun icebreaker. Mm -hmm. um, using questions to initiate dialogue. We want to get them talking. Seeking clarification. And allowing for flexibility in how members choose to communicate. So what does that mean? Does that mean over the phone, um, video conference, I am? What does that mean for, for your group, for your meetings? It doesn't always have to be in one place, the same place in person. I have an awesome client in this room. I'm not going to point anybody out. But they did this with their team. And they actually sat down and they said, what's our goal as a team? How do we want to be seen as within the organization? And they wrote it down. And then now everybody knows that's how we want to be seen with. Your behaviors better match that. And group think, some symptoms of group think, like I said earlier, it's probably um, where our group shares a brain. They're, they're not um, questioning each other. They're not challenging each other. We don't want a team full of group think. We don't, we don't want people to not push back on one another, respectfully, of course. It's okay to, to disagree. It's okay to challenge each other, as long as we're doing it in a respectful way. So how do we combat that group think where everybody shares the brain and wants to think alike and doesn't want to push back? Um, we we um, seek objectively by representing um, viewpoints and opinions. We maybe but we'll point a point in a, dev, a devil's advocate. We might encourage diversity of ideas, processes, skill set. What are we doing today? And soliciting those new ideas. What are those individuals' new ideas? So if we're elevating our team and we're building our, our leadership skills, hopefully we're getting to a culture of engagement. We want to have engagement so we retain those top performers. And what if as, as an organization you could build a culture where feedback was welcomed? You could fill more positions internally. What if you could re reduce turnover without increasing pay? How about increasing your productivity? What if you could spend less on training and still develop employees? and determine who is going to success, be the successor to you or others within, within the organization. And the company, you as a leader and the manager and the employee, all have a role, all play a role in increasing employee engagement. So some of the company's to-dos, if we want to increase our engagement, tools and equipment, it's kind of a no-brainer, but on somebody's first day, let's have their computer there, their phone ready. How do we log on to our system? We want our processes to be in place and Bless clear you. and consistent. We want individuals to see the link between what they're doing and the organization. Remember, we want to teach the business of the business. 
What's our why? How do we make money? What's our mission? What's our strategy? What's our vision? Does everybody know it? Can everybody articulate it? Is it wrapped into our performance reviews and our interview questions so we're attracting the right people? Is our culture open and honest? Do we really have that open door or is it half open? Or if people share feedback, are they jumping off the ship? Again, carry out succession planning and promote it internally. We want to do that. We want to have successors within the organization. Allow staff to have the freedom, the autonomy, and give them responsibility. As a company, we also want to put people first and reward people for their contributions and their efforts. And as managers, are we doing the following? Have you done these things? Do you schedule time to recognize employees? Do you put some time on your calendar? I'm going to recognize employees because we're so busy being busy. We've got a lot to do. We've got those emails and voicemails to check and return. But we also need to remember to recognize our employees. Have you discussed career development with your employees? Again, maybe you're in a small organization where there's not a career ladder to climb. But where can they learn and grow? What other things can we help them with? Is there stretch assignments? Have we asked employees what excites them about their job? Have we asked employees what their passions or hobbies are? What parts are, of their job aren't fun? What do, you, what do they find disengaging? Maybe you can't take it away. We all have parts of our job that if we could give away to somebody, we would. But we can't always do that. Do they have direct, your direct, direct reports have clear expectations of their job duties? And is there a way to put fun into work? Allie and I put fun into our work when we look for pictures for our slideshow. The duck picture, like I said, we spent about five minutes laughing about that. So we have fun at work. And would your employees check this box? Are they engaged? Do they give you that feedback? Do they innovate and help others? Are they creative thinkers? Do they give that discretionary effort? Do they really go the extra mile? Do they explain your company as a we or a they? Do they feel pride in, the, in their work and responsibility in their work to you and your company? When you're interviewing people, that's a good clue too. When they say, when you're asking about their company and if they say we or they, yeah. you can tell if they're engaged. Because they're probably going to be engaged either place, right? So think about, well, they do this, this, and this versus, well, we do, right? So that's a good tip too for when you're interviewing. So engagement, we have to set the example, right? Sell the mission statement to your team, just like they're an investor, right? We have to be passionate about it. We have to show up every day. If we're mad, we can't necessarily tell them, right? There are some things we have to be like, just let that blow over. Um, a team is only as strong as the players, right? We're only as strong as our weakest link. So how do we make everybody else um, strong? We have to inspire our staff, show them how much we appreciate their work. Most of us are really appreciative of all of our employees, but sometimes we forget to say it, right? Because it doesn't always seem natural. So we have to figure out a way to do that. Um, and then share our passion and lead from the front lines, right? That's serving leadership, being there with them, knowing what's going on, knowing what their jobs are. You know, if they're doing a presentation, coming to it, or if they're, you know, um, presenting a new idea to the board, whatever that is, being there and supporting them and being their cheerleader in the back. So be good for goodness sake, really set that example. You're being, wa anybody watch Persons of Interest, the show? You know, in the beginning, <laughs> you know, in the beginning, they're going, you're being watched, right? I like that. So you're being watched, right? That's what management is. Everybody's looking at every move that you're making and they're evaluating it. And so what are we doing to make sure that we're being reflective of what we really want to be seen as? And if managers don't want to work here, if they think this is the workplace, worst place ever, why would I want to be here, right? So it's all about that and walking the walk, you know, treating everyone with dignity and respect and not saying, well, this employee is my favorite. So... She's going to come with me to every I know, project. I your favorite. Right. <laughs> and then continuously giving, you know, your best effort as well. Um, so that's the big thing that we see. A lot of managers, maybe you worked with someone for a long time or they have a really good bond because they're very similar. Make sure if you have a big team that you're treating everybody as equal so no one feels like the third wheel or, you know, left out. And how is your attitude? Does everybody know who this guy is or anybody in the room? That guy catching the ball? Vaughn Miller. So funny story, I was in Las Vegas a couple weeks ago um, taking the elevator back up to my hotel room with my sister and uh, in the elevator with me is Vaughn Miller. I didn't know it. We got, we got off the elevator, he went up to the penthouse and my sister was like, that was Vaughn Miller. 
So. And Jen's I, like, who's Von Miller? I'm like, who's Von Miller? <laughs> so. <laughs> So is your attitude worth catching as a manager? Again, are you walking the walk? Are you excited to be at work every day? Is your attitude worth catching? We want employees to be engaged. Because it's, it's contagious, right? If you're passionate, employees are going to be passionate. Um, and again, create integrity, um, talk and treat each other you know, equally, give quality products, set the example, do what you say you're going to do and also expect that of them, um, and find ways to recognize your employees with their passions. And we also want to do the what's right test, right? As managers, we don't want to get ourselves into any hot water or sticky situations. So we want to set the example and do the right thing. Is it legal? Does it comply with our rules and guidelines? Does it match up with our mission and our vision? Will I be guilt-free if I do this? Would I treat a family or friend this way? Or would I do this to my family or friend? Would I be OK with someone, t someone else doing this to me? So as managers, again, setting that tone, doing the right thing, having the right attitude, and taking the what's right test are really important. If I have to go do something that I'm scared to do, you know what I do? I call my mentor and I say, this is what I have to do. Walk me through what I think I should do. Because then when I have to do it, I can't chicken out because she's going to call and she's going to say, how'd it go? Right? And so I was like, gosh, I did it. I called her after and I was like, I did it. I had that difficult conversation. I didn't want to, but I just pictured you in the back of my head being like, you better do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, you know, also having some of that accountability too. Um, do the right thing, even if it's hard, and finding people to help you get there. So this is probably one of mine and Jen's favorite concepts is the psychological contract. Um, and really what it is, and you may have heard it before, and we talked about this kind of with the levels of engagement. The work that the employees puts in, they want something reciprocated. Generally, I work for you, you pay me, right? That's not really necessarily good enough. Some people come in and they're like, I'm just gonna punch the clock and that's fine. I'm gonna say that's probably 1% of your population, right? A lot of other people really want something more. So if I give you the time, if I'm picking up over, over time, if I'm coming forward with new ideas and I'm being creative and I'm helping train new employees or I'm giving some supervision, I expect that you give me that work-life integration or that well-being or you give me the status and the respect and the appreciation, or you give me benefits to go along with it, and I have job security. So all of these things on the left-hand side, the employee, what they input, these are things that really rise with maturity and length of service, and they increase in depth, and then also as I'm with the company, I expect more, right? Because if I'm really engaged and I'm putting all that effort forward, I'm gonna accept, expect something back from you. And so the pay is the external factors, and each side is mostly blind to the external factors on the other side. So we don't necessarily know what's exactly going on or what we want, but it's really important that our managers are aware of this and we're recognizing it. Because what happens is if the psychological contract, which is unwritten, right? It's not something we sign. You do this, I'll give you that. It's an unwritten contract. It's unwritten expectations, and it's different for every employee and every company. But it has the opportunity to really strengthen that relationship and it really causes employees to be setting that stage for moving forward within the organization and helping us le elevate our team. Can go back. And if we, if we break this psychological contract with our employees, it's really hard to recover from this, right? They get that bad taste in their mouth, they get negative. It's really hard to bounce back from a situation like this, so it's really important that we don't break psychological contracts with our employees. That's why maybe we need to have those frequent check-ins, and that's why sometimes we need to say, let me think about this, we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Um, because the decision that we make at a split second could really impact that relationship and it's super hard to come back from. So the top 10 ways and we know an employee is engaged. If they bring new ideas to work, if they're passionate and enthusiastic about the work, if they take initiative, if they're always seeking to improve themselves or the others around them, consistently exceeding goals, objectives, they're curious about us as an organization, they ask a lot of questions, they encourage team members, maybe they smile at work. What a concept, huh? They overcome obstacles and stay focused on tasks. They're committed to you as an organization. They explain the organization as a we. We do it this way, we do it that way, not they. Well, they are like this, they are like that. We want them to say we, right? So just some final thoughts for you guys today is a little to-do list, because I know everybody was hoping to get things to do on their to-do list today. Um, you know, evaluate your teams. That's what, you know, 
take a look at the people that we have. Do we have enough people that are the high performers, future leaders, or do we have people in that review category on the nine box where we have to figure out either we have to get you back up there or we have to exit you from the organization? Um, and then also, you know, who are your key performers that you're going to try to retain? And then what are things that you're going to do to do that, right? So making an action plan for each employee. You know what, we're going to try to retain this employee. These are going to be a skill so we can grow and develop them. And then what are the three, three things that you're going to work on in the next month, six months, and then what else? Maybe you learn something else uh, from this seminar, and that's going to be an opportunity for you to bring back. Does anybody else have any learnings that they want to share with the group or something that they're going to go back and do within their organization? Someone just say one so Jen and I don't feel bad about ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what a fun way to just make it less intimidating. Yep. How many of you are like, yes, I have 10 meetings today? Right. It's super fun to start off with the dice too because even if you've worked with somebody for two months or two years, you learn something new about that person. Um, we I was pretty devastated. <laughs> I learned something about Jen. I'm like, I can't believe I didn't know that about you. <laughs> yep. So, so they're just, it's really just a fun, light way to start the meeting. I like that. That's a good, good. one. Anything else? Just one more. Just one more thing. <laughs> I think it was about an actor or something that you like. Yes. I think that's what it was. That I like Ryan Reynolds. Yeah, she was like super, like super, like when she said it, like she was crazy about how she said it. And I was like, I had no idea there was so much passion there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Good. All right. Well, we'll stick around if anybody has questions or wants to talk one-on-one. -on -one. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for coming. We thank really you. appreciate you being here. Um, and have a great rest of this day.